The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. Hi, this is Mia Mohsen Zia, also known as Mia No Time for Love. Check out my latest book, Missing, available in print and e-book formats on Amazon. It's now time for the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios and sponsored by international award-winning author Mia Mohsen Zia of Missing. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on over 40 podcast platforms, as well as HamiltonRadio.net, Diamonds FM, and the TheMikeWagnerShow.com. We can be heard in over 100 countries, featuring over 1,000 well-known and amazing guests throughout the globe, and named one of the top 100 global podcasts in the New York Weekly Times, Hollywood Entertainment News, Los Angeles Weekly Times, Apple, and Chartable. So sit back and relax and enjoy another great episode of the award-winning Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios and brought to you by official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author, Mia Molson's The Missing, available on Amazon at Paperback and Ebook. We're here with a terrific gentleman who's an author, professor of the uh, Department of Latin America and Latinx Studies at John Jay Univers- uh, College of uh, City in New York. He was born in uh, La Han- Havana, Cuba, and uh, emigrated to U.S. Uh, back in the 60s. He's currently living in Miami as well. He settled in Miami, uh, graduated from the University of Miami in sociology, anthropology, Apology and served at Florida International University for 12 years. And um, he also has a book out which tells a, a multicultural generational story that's distinctly Cuban and relative to the immigrant families with everywhere who you are uh, coming for survival as well of democracy. And of course, relays tales of um, two officers who fought against the, um, the Spanish for Cuban independence. Also, families divided, orphans uh, end up, um, you know, you know, getting a mass fortune, going from ranks to riches, uh, fatal love triangles and more. A lot of stories about Cuba. It's uh, in a book called The House on G Street, A Cuban Family Saga. Live, ladies and gentlemen, and plus two in beautiful downtown Miami, the amazing author and professor of uh, Latin America and Latinx uh, studies at John Jay College City, New York, with a book, The House on G Street, A Cuban Family Saga. Ladies and gentlemen, the multi-talented Lissandra Perez. Lissandra, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for that great introduction. I, I'm very excited to talk to you about the book. Well, it's great to have you on as well, too. And I wish I had a Cuban cigar and some rum right now. So <laughs> <laughs> that can be arranged, I think. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I'm sure, you know, I have a virtual assistant, AI, chat, GPT, come and do that. I mean, that'd be great. So, so you know, before we uh, place the order, you're an author, professor in the Department of um, Latin, Latin America and Latinx uh, Studies at John Jay College City, New York. You were born in La Havana, Cuba, and um, you emigrated to U.S. with your uh, parents back in the 60s. You settled in Miami, graduated from University of Miami, and also served at Florida International University for 12 years. And uh, your book tells a multicultural uh, generational uh, story that distinctly Cuban and uh, relative to immigrant uh, families uh, with everyone who involved survival democracy and just has all kinds of tales in the book, The House on G Street, A Cuban Family Saga. saga. And before getting all this, Sandra, Tell us how you first got started. Well, actually, this book, I think I got started uh, when I was fairly young. I, one of the, uh, the, the most of the material that I have in this book, I've really been gathering it all my life. I was always very attentive, sort of quiet uh, child. And I listened to what uh, my grandparents had to say. I listened to their stories. I actually encouraged them to tell me stories. So <laughs> I, you can say I've been gathering material for this book my entire life. Uh, of course, I became a sociologist and a researcher and a historian. So I started also not only depending on those family stories, but also doing some research that sort of filled out those stories. And so uh, the book is is actually rests on a combination of sources, those family stories, uh, photographs that I have of the family, and then of uh, Cuban uh, history and research into Cuban history, because I, I thought it was important to put those family stories in the context of Cuban history. So this is a book about Cuban history with a family story in it, or maybe it's a family story with Cuban history in it, but mm. it's that's what it that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. But either way, it's really good entertainment material. And of course, I've been fascinated by it for quite some time as well. And what was that one precise moment that simply influenced you into writing a book or what you're doing? What was that one precise moment that simply said, this is what I'm going to do? It's like a light bulb going off. 
Well, I, my previous book uh, that I wrote was on Cuban families in New York City in the 19th century. I, I thought that, uh, you know, most of my research is on the Cuban-American community. I, I usually studied the contemporary community. But this was the 19th century community that I decided to study. And I told the stories of a lot of those families. And then I said to myself, you know, my family has also pretty interesting stories. And I, I've accumulated them all my life. Uh, and uh, and I think I want to leave that uh, for my children, my grandchildren. Uh, but at the same time, I want to write a book about Cuban history. So that's when the sort of the light bulb went up, went out that I said, you know, I, I really ought to um, uh, put this down in writing. All of these stories that I've uh, that I've uh, that I've uh, gathered, and uh, and if those families were very interesting, they were not my families. But now I was writing about my family, and I thought they were equally interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also interesting, too, that you were born in La Havana, Cuba, and you emigrated to U.S., uh, your parents, going back to 1960. And that was um, quite a story right there. Well, yes. I mean, this was two years into the revolution. Revolution takes place in January 1st, 1959, which is when Fidel Castro uh, uh, rises to power. Uh, and we did not leave. We left in October of 1960. Uh, I would say that 1959 was still, life was pretty normal in many ways. But in 1960, things started changing very rapidly. And it's not that my family had a lot of, you know, property or things. A lot of people left because they lost property or they were threatened politically. That was not the case with my family. I think my father and many of his brothers and sisters, he had nine brothers and sisters, hmm. um, he, 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 it, it, he realized that Cuba was going to change in ways that he found very threatening. And uh, I think ultimately he was right. I mean, I think it would have been a world that would have been very hard for him and for my mother to adjust to. So so uh, we left for the United States. There was also the idea that we weren't leaving permanently because, you know, the U.S. was not going to allow this to happen. That is, it wasn't going to allow in the middle of the Cold War for uh, uh, a pro-Soviet ally to arise 90 miles from the United States. There's certainly a lot of history in which the U.S. prevented those things from happening in Latin America. So it and it wasn't for lack of trying. Of course, if we go back to the Bay of Pigs and many uh, efforts of the U.S. to overthrow the Cuban government, but uh, the fact is um, that uh, it turned out to be permanent. And uh, so uh, uh, that was what sixty more than sixty years ago, and uh, we haven't gone back. I've gone back. Um, most of my family has not, but I've gone back to Cuba uh, very uh, quite often, actually, starting in nineteen seventy nine. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think uh, Cuba will ever go back to its uh, pre-1959, pre-Fidel uh, Castro? Oh, uh, I don't think so. I think there it may be that that it, there will be a bit more, let's say, capitalism capitalism or, or free, free market and so forth. But uh, I think, for one thing, the, the social class that uh, in many ways my parents belonged to and that uh, was uh, threatened by the Cuban Revolution, I think that social class... Uh, of course, in many ways, disappeared. It moved to Miami. It didn't disappear. It moved to Miami, actually. Uh, and it's here in Miami. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think Cuba is going to be ever be the same as it was. And uh, that's not a bad thing, I might add, because, you know, there were a lot of things that were, did not go right with the Cuba before 1959 either, which is why there was a revolution. Mm, how, uh, how so? That's interesting, because I get people <laughs> asking me about that. Was it better off with or without Castro? And what was really like back in, you know, 1959? Well, economic wise, political, social yeah. and everything else before Castro took over. Right. I, I think I think that you have to look at it in terms of, you know, whose Cuba was it? Um for um, members of, of the social class that my parents belonged to, of course, the revolution and, and the socialist system that would come in and, and take away private enterprise and, and replace it with a one-party system and whatever was terrible news, and they left, right? But again, Cuba was a country in which, yes, the, the Havana was a wonderful place in the sense that that it was flush with American automobiles, it was a cosmopolitan city, but you know, Cuba in 1958 was ruled by a military ruler unconstitutionally. It had an, an, an impoverished peasantry, uh, and uh, and they had these contradictions. So I think that's what made revolution possible in Cuba. And so uh, 
I don't think I'd want to go back to that era, even though, again, it was one, it's an era that I'm nostalgic for because of my childhood. But I think Cuba, uh, uh, I hope, moves forward and um and becomes a, a kind of nation where where again there's justice and there's uh uh, uh you know people can sort of uh, live out their dreams in many ways i think that's one of the problems with cuba today is that uh, you know the the, gov- the state um uh doesn't allow a lot of freedom uh economic freedom and and so forth uh so so that's that's something to to think about Mm-hmm. And, and of course, you talk about the, the military rule back, you know, before 1958. Has there a military rule long before that, even when Cuba first got established? Uh, yes. Well, you know, the Cuban Republic, which came into being in 1902, uh, when the U.S. left Cuba and and essentially turned Cuba over to a Cuban government, uh, it had a lot of ups and downs. It, there were a number of democratically elected presidents, uh, but there were also dictators as well. There was one like between 1925 and 1933. And then, of course, Fulgencio Batista came in with a coup in 1952 in which he disrupted also a democratic constitutional order and just installed himself as the military ruler just because he could. You know, he had the support of the military. So so he so he was, uh, in that sense, a, a, a dictator. He was not uh, constitutionally elected. Uh, and I think that's the kind of, that's the kind of, situation that gives rise, you know, to a revolution. I mean, it happened in Mexico as well, you know? Mm-hmm. The Mexican Revolution of 1910 was a reaction to the uh, Porfiriato, or the rule of Porfirio Diaz. So usually when you have dictators, you sometimes have revolutions. Mm-hmm. And, and it does, too, that uh, you also had a strong American influence, you know, especially a young child as well. You kind of get that presence, too, and uh, benefits, contradictions, and, um, and, and everything else. So it's just kind of like, you know, how would you manage to handle it by a rational well, world? Well, yeah, I, I I grew up in a binational world, and then the nineteen fifties were one Cuban novelist described it as those American years, because this is when American influence in Cuba really reached a kind of a crescendo, uh, a climax, if you will, and you had a lot of you know influence of the U.S. I went, uh, my father uh, and mother wanted me to learn English. It was important that I learn English because he, that is my father, had gone to an to a school in the united states his his father uh put him in a boarding school in long island mm. uh and um, and he learned english and he saw the value of learning english in cuba so so he put me essentially in an american school in havana uh that had about half of the students more than half of the students were americans and another half were uh, cuban students like myself whose parents wanted us to learn english and we had the day was split the the morning was in English. We had American history. We had spelling. We had, you know, all the American subjects. Even in arithmetic was in English. Hmm. Uh, and then in the afternoon we had classes in Spanish, uh, Cuban history, Cuban geography, uh, Spanish grammar, and so forth. So it was this binational world that I lived in. And um, and again, the influence of the U.S. was very great. We of course went to see a lot of American movies. Um, it, it was a very much, I think it's very difficult for Americans today, given, given the, <clears throat> the distance and the hostility between the U S and Cuba, uh, to actually, you know, realize that back then, uh, there were very few countries that were as close as the U S and Cuba, and that there was this tremendous influence of the U S and Cuba. And part of what my book does is talk from a child's perspective about how I live that sort of binationality, that sort of American and Cuban world. And I think a lot of Americans just don't don't realize just how American Cuba was, uh, given now how 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 many ways uh, distant are the relations. Mm-hmm. You, you talked about uh, going to see American movies um, in Miami. You were growing up. How about the uh, entertainment in um, Cuba compared to um, America as well, like the movies, the music, and um, literature, and everything else? Yeah, well, Cuba had a very vibrant culture. I mean, uh, you know, and so uh, particularly in the in literature, um, in the arts, and so forth. Uh, the movie, the movie or film industry was not as developed in Cuba. Uh, we tended to watch American movies. There were some Cuban movies that had been made at that time, but certainly in terms of literature and the arts, uh, Cuba experienced a real explosion in the 1930s, and the 40s, and 50s, um, as as sort of uh, consumer trends increased and so forth. There was also a market for art. Uh, it was a, it was a very vibrant place. Havana, Havana was just a very vibrant place. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, as well, too. And of course, you know, you know, speaking of a lot of others, you also wrote your book. You talk about um, your numerous families. A lot of things are going on. Like two officers fighting against the Spanish um, for Cuban independence, families divided and a lot more, even a fatal love triangle. We'll find out more with uh, the house on G Street, a Cuban family saga with Sandra Perez. But first, listen to the Mike Widener Show at the Mike Widener Show dot com, powered by Soundweb Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SonicWebStudios.com. Mention the Mike Widener Show. Get 20% off your first projects. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout-out to our official sponsor, the Mike Widener Show, International War Ring author, Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those who love be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia's got great reviews. An evil of an enjoys by Howard celebrities, including Jordan Cassidy, Forge Riley, and Manales. So grab your copy today. Four Girls Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at the Mike show.com and our 40 podcast platforms. Heard in 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also, Apple Music, Odyssey, BitChute, Rumble, YouTube, Pandora, Podbean, and follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And tickets with you on any mobile device. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Weiner Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies. Makes great gifts 24-7 year-round. Go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Weiner Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Slash me and Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once, and Wrinkles. Plus T-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash me and Molson Zia. Check it out today and support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and the Mike Widener Show.com. We're here with author and professor of uh, Department of Latin American and um, Latinx Studies at John Jay College of City, New York. Lissandra Perez here on the Mike Widener Show with the book, The House on G Street, A Cuban Family Saga. And before I talk more about the book, uh, you also had a previous one. We covered just a bit, maybe a bit more in detail. Sugar, Cigars, and Revolution, The Making of Cuban New York. Tell us a bit about that. Well, you know, I, I most of my career has been devoted to studying the Cuban presence in the United States, and and I was for many years on the faculty at Florida International University here in Miami, and uh, and so I studied the contemporary Cuban American community. But I always felt that we didn't know enough about the history of Cuban Americans in the United States. We knew quite a bit about the Florida cigar making communities, you know, uh, Ybor City and and. Uh, and Key West, which were important Florida cigar-making communities. But I always thought that New York was really the most important 19th century community, and there had been very little research done on it. So mm -hmm. I dove right in. Um, I'm a sociologist, but I sort of became a historian. And uh, I had was fortunate enough to get a grant, actually a fellowship, a residential fellowship at the New York Public Library. That brought me into contact with a lot of sources, archives, and I discovered all these Cubans wow. who lived in uh, New York uh, in the 19th century. And not only that, that they were very important in Cuban history. Um, for example, there were connections very early. And I'm talking 1820s between Cuba and New York because a lot of Cuban sugar that was being produced at that time, and there was a big sugar boom. A lot of, of, of sugar that was produced at that time was actually sold in New York. Hmm. It was shipped to New York. And so there was this relationship that, re that developed between uh, Cuban ports and New York, and a lot of a lot of not only a traffic of sugar and also cigars, but also a traffic in people, of course, that came back and forth. And a lot of the elites in Cuba uh, at the time, particularly the sugar plantation owners, they uh, had in many cases homes in New York and they traveled mm -hmm. back and forth to New York. So, and it was in New York that a lot of the independence movements uh, got started. The annexationists, for example, were in New York. They tried to annex Cuba to the U.S. That failed with the Civil War. But then thereafter, there were the independence movements. And uh, in 1870, was really 1870 was the year in which I think the Cuban community in New York reached its height. And I have the stories there of many of the families and many of their activities for getting rid of Spanish colonialism. Because, of course, mm. during all this time, uh, Cuba is a Spanish colony and uh, didn't gain its independence um, really until the U.S. leaves in 1902. 
So Cuba was very late with its independence. And this is the story of the Cubans who lived in New York up until like 1898. I don't go into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. and, and and how did um you know Cuba get its independence? So what what was that one event that got to a point where Cuba got its independence in 1902? Well, uh, of course, what, what happened is that the Cubans initiated a war. Uh, actually, it was started in New York. Uh, Jose Martí, who has a big statue in, in New York City in Central Park, was the uh, founder of the Cuban independence movement. He started organizing everything from New York, finally launched everything in 1895. He's actually killed in a Cuban battlefield in May of 1895, but the war continues. And as we know, which, which is part of U.S. history, the U.S. enters the war, uh, in 1898, uh, and it was what uh, the Secretary of State uh, at the time called a splendid little war because it didn't last very long. The U.S., of course, won that war, especially because it defeated uh, Spain uh, in the in the oceans, and it was primarily a naval victory. Mm -hmm. uh, once uh, Sp Spain lost its navy, it was not able to, to conduct a war against the U.S., especially, so it was a very short war. But as a result of that, uh, the U.S. took over Cuba and Puerto Rico wow. and the Philippines, which were, of course, previously uh, Spanish colonies. And what it decided to do, uh, it, it governed Cuba from uh, 1899 until 1902. And I have quite a bit of that in, in the book uh, on the House on G Street because my great-grandfather on my mother's side actually worked for that government. Uh, a U.S. government. He was also educated in the U.S. and he knew English and he knew accounting. So he was a principal figure in the auditor's office for that government. So I have quite a bit about the, the U.S. governing Cuba from 1899 to 1902. Then they decided, the U.S. decided to just turn over, uh, you know, the government, the government, get the governing of Cuba to a Cuban government. They did it with some strings attached, which was called the Platt Amendment. Uh, but uh, but that's how Cuba became independent. There's some Cuban historians who say that even in 1902, Cuba was not independent because it had quite a bit of control from coming from Washington, and it wasn't really independent in making a lot of decisions. But anyway, that's when it actually has a government. Mm -hmm. you, you also talk about having a number of Cubans in Miami and New York. Uh, what are some other uh, popular Cuban um, you know locations around the U.S. besides Miami and New York? Well, historically, of course, Key West and Tampa. In Tampa, you had in 1886, you had the creation of a cigar-making community that was totally initiated by Cuban cigar makers from Cuba who built their factories there. They built housing uh, for the workers. And that, by the 1890s, uh, Ybor City, which was named after Vicente Martinez Ybor, who was the cigar maker who started the project, that was the largest Cuban community at that time. Uh, then, of course, New York took over again. And then finally, when the Cuban Revolution comes in in 1959, of course, Miami is the principal uh, community for Cubans. There's also some other prominent communities still in New York, uh, some in Los Angeles. And recently, for reasons that uh, are not entirely, well, that are not entirely understood, there's been a large nucleus of Cubans in Louisville, Kentucky. Really? Louisville, yeah. Kentucky, of uh, yes, all places? I can't imagine that. I don't know. I think it has to do at a lot of the, uh, you know, what happens sometimes with migration is when a lot of people get settled in a the place, then other people follow. And for some reason, they found opportunity. These are more recent arrivals, right? People who have arrived within the past 10 or 15 years, they have found uh, by apparently a home in Louisville. Wow, that is interesting. And it sure wasn't horse racing, was it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. You know, it could be, uh, for all I know. Uh, uh, there was, a, in the 1960s, there was a lar rather large Cuban community in Las Vegas. And part of it was, is that, of course, Cuba had a lot of casinos uh, prior to the revolution. When the revolution came in, they outlawed gambling. So mm -hmm. all the people, croupiers and all those guys who run, you know, the gambling tables and whatever were out of a job and they went to Las Vegas. That makes sense. I think that's a great story right there, too. And, of course, you know, you know, speaking of great stories and, um, you know, one of them, you know, talks about two officers who fought against the Spanish for Cuban independence. I think that was covered. If you want to talk more about that's fine. Families divide as well, too. And um, you also got some people went from rags to riches. That's a really good story. Yes, I think I think that's in many ways one of the more interesting stories uh, because I think what part of what is also always said about the Cuban uh, 
a revolution. What a part of what is said about the Cuban Republic is that it was a very close, you know, it was an elite that was very close. But there's the story of my grandfather, who, by the way, has had the same name. I'm, I'm, I was named after him. I was named after my father, who was named after him. Uh, my grandfather, my matern- maternal uh, grandfather, was an orphan boy from central Cuba who uh, developed a very prosperous business uh, exporting leaf tobacco to the United States. Mm-hmm. So he became a kind of a, an expert in the quality of tobacco leaves, and he developed a very strong uh, um, uh, set of, of tobacco farmers who sold to him his crop, their crops. And he then processed those leaves. Uh, actually, that process would take up to seven years sometimes. Wow, seven years. Leaves. I wanted that cigar now. Now I know why <laughs> they're so <Right>? good. <laughs> and, and you know, it, 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 the leaves were, I have a, an entire chapter in this book in which I detail this process because the leaves had to be matured. Uh, they had to be fermented. They had to be stemmed. You know, they had to remove the middle rib and so forth. They had to be uh, st- be in storage under humid conditions for a long time. And then finally, they were shipped to the U.S. And he became uh, the sole exporter for the General Cigar Company. The General Cigar Company in New York, with which had its facilities in, uh, in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And he was their uh, provider of Cuban tobacco for cigars that were manufactured in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so he made quite a bit of money and he did it with a lot of hard work and a lot of developing an expertise in personal relations in the tobacco world in Cuba. And uh, and that's a story that I was I was very proud to tell because I think that was a story that, you know, he always avoided politics. He never got into politics or anything. There were a lot of people in Cuba who, who did very well financially and who tried to avoid politics because you know, one time once you get involved in politics, it becomes a very you know risky proposition. He actually had an offer from uh, the president in 1928 to run for the Senate, and he said, "No, I, I don't think so." And it was a good decision because that president became very unpopular, wow. and when he was finally thrown out of power, people turned upon those who were his supporters. But of course, he stayed. He stayed at the margins of that. Mm. So that's a that's a story about you know my paternal grandfather. Mm-hmm. The um, the the officers who fought in the Cuban War of Independence uh, were two. One was a my my great grandfather on my mother's side, who did you know uh, fight uh, in the Cuban War of Independence. He rose to the rank of colonel, and he became the chief auditor for the Cuban government in arms. And later on, he became the chief auditor for the Cuban Republic, this is the one who worked for the U.S. provisional government as well. So he was a rather prominent historical figure. The other uh, the other uh, officer who, who fought for uh, Cuban independence was the uncle of my paternal grandmother. And he was also very prominent. He rose to be colonel, and he was killed in, uh, in the, uh, trying to assault, uh, launch an assault, on the main garrison in the city called Santa Clara. And today, the Central Park in Santa Clara, which is a principal uh, Cuban city in central Cuba, uh, bears his name. It's named after him, Leoncio Vidal, and there's a bust of him on the park. I've taken my picture several times with the bust. So, uh, it's. I mean, one of the reasons I decided to write this book is not just, you know, to write about my family, but because I thought they were interesting stories. You know, the, the, these were these were actually these stories that I've inherited and that I've done research on are actually interesting, and uh, and I th- and I hope uh, people find it, them interesting as well. Mm-hmm. And to certainly fall in love with your stories and more. And speaking of falling in love, we'll find out what one story about it. it is it that or a triangle? We'll find out what it is with Alessandro Perez and the House on G Street, a Cuban family saga. You listen to the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com, powered by Sonic Studios, and brought to you by our official sponsor of the Mike Widener Show, Interact Warring Author, Mia Molson Zam. We'll be back with author Alessandro Perez of the House on G Street after this time. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios.
If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley and I'm an American actress and a TV host and I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter and it's very well done. I'm gonna highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I wanna give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamotionzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers, and boy, are you in luck. Right place, right time. Tuned in to The Mike Wagner Show. You heard me. We're back with author Sandra Perez of the House on G Street, a Cuban family saga here on the Mike Wagner Show. And of course, there's a lot of love and passion going on in Cuba. You know, love stories and everything else, but also there's love triangles as well. A fatal one too, especially. Yes, this is a story that I have in the book. Um, I, I thought a lot about including it or not, but I thought I thought it would, not only was it a good story, but it, it, it actually explains a lot. Uh, and I only learned the story. I did not learn the story as a child. I only learned the story after my father died. It involves my father, and I only learned of it after after he after he died because uh, his brothers told me about it. And everyone in the town in in Camahuani, Camahuani is the town where uh, his father had most of his business. It turns out that that uh, my grandfather hired his son uh, to run a business in this town in central Cuba. And my uh, the family had already moved to Havana, so my my father was living there as a young man. He had graduated from a high school in New York, but when he returned to Cuba, his father put him in charge of this business, which was a a business in 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 uh, making chorizos, right? Oh, wow. uh, this, uh, and and it was a plant in 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 that town, which my grandfather bought and then put put his son, my father, in charge of that chorizo plant in which he had to gather all this cattle and, 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 you know, cattle and pigs and so forth and process the meat and put it into, into casings and, and can them. Anyway, he lived, he loved living in that town. He, it was one of the happiest moments in his life. Uh, but then he ran into a um, very attractive older woman. He was about 24 or so. Uh, this woman was in her early 30s, very attractive, very cosmopolitan. Uh, she owned a dress shop in, in Kamahuani in the town. A uh, very attractive woman, great conversationalist, but she was married. Mm. And um, uh, her husband was a house painter uh, who uh, they, they did not have any children. Uh, and he was a kind of a gruffy guy, did not like social activities. And she uh, met my father and they started having a relationship. Uh, and uh, of course, this was probably something my uh, my father should not have done. But but again, this was an older woman. I mean, she it wasn't he was taking advantage of a younger of a younger woman or anything like that. Uh, and what happened eventually is, of course, it's a small town. Everybody learned about it, mm. and uh, the husband learned about it. And one day, he walked into into the bedroom where she was getting ready to go to work at her dress shop and said, you got to, you know, you have to end this relationship. And she said, no. And he took out a gun and shot her twice wow. and then shot himself. And immediately, uh, my uh, uncle, uh, uh, my great uncle, I should say, uh, when he saw this immediately went to get my father and put him on the first train to Havana because this woman actually had, um, uh, this woman actually had very aggressive brothers. She had a whole three or four brothers who were sort of a very aggressive, and they knew that would, they would blame him for it. And so uh, he couldn't go back to the town for seven years. Wow. And this was the town where where my grandfather has tobacco operations. It would have been a place for him to have been 
to work with the uh, with the tobacco business, but and the chorizo business. But uh, he couldn't uh, go back to Camajoni. His life was essentially threatened by the woman's brothers. And so I thought that was an important story because it explained a lot about why my father had to leave this town in which he had lived most of his youth and go back to Havana. He went back to Havana and met my mother eventually. Nice. That's a great story as well. Of course, you know, we cover about uh, business, culture, and everything else, some of the things you own. What What are some other things uh, we, all, we all learn from the book as well? Well, I, I think one of the things that that uh, that that that's important in the book is to is to find out is to really see how uh, Cuban from 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 a micro as I call it a micro perspective because I'm I'm do, doing the story of my family, but I'm tying it to Cuban history. So I think that 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 many things that that we know historically about Cuba are also explained here in a very personal level. For example, this U.S. influence in in in, in Cuba. My great grandfather on my mother's side, he worked for the Americans. He he was this uh, individual who managed the sugar, some of the largest sugar mills in Cuba. And then, of course, my father, my father's father, who developed this tobacco uh, business, and he became eventually, uh, you know, the sole exporter for General Cigar. So we see that by the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, the Cuban economy becomes more and more closely associated with the U.S. And we see this in the lives of my family. And mm-hmm. that is why I go to an American school, right? That's why my father is educated in in Long Island, why my mother's father is educated in New York Military Academy, mm-hmm. why his father is educated also in the Hudson Valley. That is, you get a real sense from a very personal level of how Cuba became in many ways a, a, an almost, you know, dependency of the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that you see there very clearly. Uh, mm-hmm. in the book and mm-hmm. that's one of the things uh, that and I think also um, uh, I deal a lot with the politics of the Cuban Republic in which my grandfather great-grandfather and my mother's side was involved in and you see how really sometimes there's a tendency to blame the U.S. for all of Cuba's problems before but we can also see how Cubans behave badly right in other words political actors who uh, engaged in a great deal of corruption, who uh, did not have the best interests of the country at stake. All of that, I think we see. I think there are certain aspects of Cuban history that get illuminated uh, by looking at it this way. Mm. And, and I think and, uh, and the process, it, I think it's a bunch of good stories as well. And what explains the bad behavior of uh, most of Cubans, especially the actors, like the source of it? Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. The, um, the, what explains the uh, bad behaviors of uh, most of the Cubans, especially the actors you talked about? Well, I think what what, what happened was you've got to realize that when, when the U.S. turns over Cuba to a Cuban government in 1902, which is when most people believe that Cuban independence starts, it did so with the strings that were specified in something called the Platt Amendment. The Platt Amendment was sponsored by Senator Orville Platt of Connecticut, inserted into an Army Appropriations Bill in in Washington, and then made part of the Cuban Constitution, made part of the Cuban Constitution as a condition for the U.S. leaving it in, in the hands of a Cuban government. That is, the Cubans were forced to accept this amendment. Among the things that the amendment stipulates is that the U.S. retains the right to intervene whenever life and property were threatened in Cuba. Uh, it also provided other things. For example, you have now, you know, you st- the U.S. is still in Guantanamo, Guantanamo Naval Base, where, uh, as we know, they have in- they've imprisoned the uh, the uh, enemy combatants after 9-11, if you recall. Guantanamo was... I, 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 do, I do remember, yeah, and they're talking about Guantanamo Bay, 9-11, yep. and everything else. It's almost like, a, uh, what was it, Alcatraz, San Quentin, or somewhere along those lines. Right. Well, there's a naval base there, and the, that naval base goes back to 1903, uh, wow. when, as a part of the Plan Amendment, Cuba was obliged to lease that property to the U.S. to set up a naval station. So all of this has history, and and the part that's important is that clause that allowed the U.S. the right to intervene in Cuban uh, affairs if life or property were threatened. Well, what happened was, is that what would happen in Cuba is that if you lost an election. Right, you would say 
maybe legitimately or illegitimately, but you would say, hey, you know, we don't we don't really respect the results of this election. So we're going to go out and we're going to make trouble. And then the U.S. will intervene and nullify the election. So it was called what set was set up was interventionist politics. Essentially, the plan amendment made the U.S. the final arbiter of the Cuban political system. And the Cubans, instead of, you know, doing perhaps what was best, did what was worse, which is play that off. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it actually happened in 1906. There was so much uh, fighting going on over the results of an election. I mean, arm fighting that Theodore Roosevelt reluctantly said, OK, we'll intervene. And then in, from 1906 to 1909, the U.S. governed Cuba again. Oh, my gosh. Directly. So what I'm saying is it's a history that uh, that uh, that that you know Cubans cannot be very proud of. Now, when I so having said that, this is all in the political arena. Cuba developed at that time a tremendous culture, tremendous. I mean, the music, the the I mean, uh, literature, everything, right? But um, uh, politics is sort of the dismal topic. Mm -hmm. and, and how about Cuba today? Well. What you have today, of course, is is a revolution that was that grew out of that, um, out of that system, and uh, a lot of people, a lot of people in 1959, when Fidel Castro rose to power, supported that revolution. My father supported it certainly. Cubans have been calling for revolutions since 1898 mm -hmm. because they they wanted a system that had social justice, that had you know equality for everyone, inclusiveness, uh, um, and and especially sovereignty. You know, to for Cubans to for Cuba to be governed by Cubans, the Cuban Republic didn't didn't deliver on those things, and so what part of what uh, the Cuban Revolution of 1959 promised to do was to go back to that agenda of of you know social justice and so forth, uh, and a lot of Cubans supported it. The thing is that for many Cubans, not for all, and maybe not for many, or uh, the reforms of that revolution went way beyond what they thought you know a revolution should do mm -hmm. uh, and for example the turning point for my father i think in deciding to leave was i mean he was all he was he had he didn't have any problem with the nationalization of us firms he didn't have any problem with many uh, you know many of the things that were that the revolution was espousing but when the revolution started saying we're going to nationalize private schools and we're going to, you know, uh, instead of having private schools, every all all children will go to a public universal public education system. Well, that sort of signaled the notion in the Cold War that children were going to be sent to state schools, maybe even to Moscow, right? Wow, in, Moscow of in, all places? In doctor, well, because the Cuba was getting close to the Soviet Union. Mm. So in the Cold War era, there was this fear Right, this fear of 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 you know uh, communism and and so forth, and so I think for my parents, I think the revolution crossed a line there, right, and that's how they felt alienated from it. Of course, if you were, you know, a peasant family in Cuba whose child didn't had very little opportunity to go to school, then you work you welcome the universal public education system. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying is that revolution affected people differently. Mm. Right. And and I think for some people it went way beyond uh, what they thought that revolution would do. Mm. That is rather interesting. In the meantime, where can we find your book at the House on G Street? Well, yeah, it's on Amazon. It's the House on G Street, a Cuban family saga. It's also on the um, on the uh, uh, website of New York University Press. The book is published by New York University Press. And actually, um, I can share with your I can share with your uh, listeners a discount code if they'd like to go to the New York University Press website. Uh, they can uh, let me reach over here. Uh, uh, you can get uh, thirty percent off if you go to the New York University Press website and put in the code NYUP thirty. That's NYUP thirty. NYUP thirty. You get a thirty percent discount on the book, and as it is, it's already only thirty-two dollars. So that's a significant discount. It's a hardback. It's a hardback uh, book, and it's it has about forty-five illustrations. 
family photographs and so forth. Okay. So again, it's NYUP30, and the website is uh, nyupress.org. NYUPress.org. Okay, well, I encourage everybody to um, go to that website, purchase the book. We're here with author Sandra Perez of the House on G Street, a Cuban family saga here on the Mike Wagner Show. Just a few more minutes, Sandra. This has been great. And what else can we expect me in 2024 and beyond? Uh, you mean personally or for Cuba? It, it, it can be uh, anything, wherever, right, you, well, wherever you want. Per personally, I'm looking forward to working on a more general book on Cuban Americans. I think there isn't there isn't a really good history of Cuban Americans, but let's talk about Cuba. Uh, I I become uh, unfortunately, I've been expecting change in Cuba for a long time. And when I mean change, I mean I don't mean like like most people or most Cuban Americans think of you know overthrowing the whole system or whatever. I just would like to see a Cuba that, for example, that that where there's plenty of opportunity for everyone, in which Cuba is not in the newspapers, you know, in which is just wow. a country that is because Cuba is so frequently in the newspapers for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see a Cuba in which you know people are just living happily and pursuing their interests and their lives, and there isn't the na the this hostility and isolation that it's currently living in, especially with the embargo with the United States. I'd like to see things normalized. I can imagine here in Miami, if things got normalized with Cuba, as it is already, there's a dozen flights daily, you know, from Miami to Havana. Wow. You know, the, the flight itself is only 40 minutes. You know? mm -hmm. So, so imagine if things were normalized and it were normal to go to Cuba and Americans could go to Cuba and they could go to Cuba and buy Cuban cigars and all kinds of things like that. It would be, it would be a different world in terms of Cuba. <laughs> I'd like to see that normalization, but I, I should say I become a pessimist about it because there have been a lot of times in which I say, oh, it's going to happen now. It's going to happen now. And then it doesn't happen. Right. <laughs> so I've sort of become a pessimist. Or go see a Rolling Stones in Havana. That was a first too. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, it's still everything is, is in, involved in, in political controversy. Nora Jones was going to do a concert in, in Havana in, uh, I think, in January, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. And they canceled it because, uh, you know, there was so much outcry in the United States among Cuban Americans. And also because some of the things that I think she was planning on doing might have violated some of some of the concert might have violated the embargo. So, you know, it's normal things like concerts can't happen, and that's a shame. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is. And, of course, you know, we're looking forward to uh, more of what you got as well, too. And um, who do you consider your biggest influence in your career? Oh, um, oh, I, I'd love to talk about him. He was my major professor. In my career, of course, my family, my parents have been the major influence in my life. Uh, but in terms of my career, I, I had a, my dissertation advisor, my PhD advisor, was an individual by the name of Thomas Lynn Smith, T. Lynn Smith. And he was a sociologist. Uh, I studied under him at the University of Florida. He was the seventh son of a Mormon sheep rancher from Colorado. Wow. And he developed an expertise on Latin America, and he learned Spanish as well. And he taught me uh, how to be a professor. He taught me sociology. He taught me everything I needed to do. And not only that, he recommended me for my first job, which was at Louisiana State University. That's where I had my first faculty position. So I owe T. Lynn, T. Lynn a, uh, a great debt of, of gratitude. Certainly does. And it's amazing too. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Uh, well, I, I, you know, if, if in terms of advice to anybody, uh, I, I would, if, if you read my book, you'll see that it has become more, it's become more, it's become easier to do research on one's family. The internet has made it, I mean, a lot of the family stories that I heard and that I have in this book, uh, I was able to research them and fill them out with information that I was able to gather on the, on the, uh, on the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, I, for example, I always heard the story that my, my grandparents on my mother's side had met in a party in the Upper West Side of New York. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I said, let me research that. If they did, they must have come in on a, on a, on a ship somewhere, right? My father, my grandfather was studying at New York Military Academy. My grandmother was visiting. What ship did she arrive in? When did she arrive? All of this you can, you can find online. And I would encourage people to look at their family stories.
Mm -hmm. I think that's a really great point. And I'll do some research on mine as well, too. So we're here with Arthur Lissandra Perez of the House on G Street, a Cuban family saga here on the Mike Widener Show. Lissandra, very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Learned a lot from you. Looking forward to having you soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love have you back. Once again, what's your website? How do people contact you? Where can people purchase or check out your works? Well, yeah, I have a website. Uh, I'm at John Jay College, uh, which is part of the City University of New York. If you go to the website of John Jay College, I have a faculty web page there. It has a little biography. It also has my email address, which I'll just mention it. It's L-O-P-E-R-E-Z at J-J-A-Y dot C-U-N-Y dot E-D-U. So, but uh, I'm at the John Jay College website. If you look for my name, you'll find my faculty web page. And that has all my publications and, and where my books have been published and uh, and uh, a small biography as well. We'll certainly check that out. Once again, sound a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely amazing. Learned a lot. Looking forward to having you soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. Wish you all the best. And Lissanda, you definitely have a great future to have you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me on my program. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention the Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter and it's very well done. I'm gonna highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I want to give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamotionzea.com. Missing. Available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show. Brought to you by international award-winning author Mia Mosin Zia of Missing and powered by Sonic Web Studios. Be sure to join us again on over 40 podcast platforms and, of course, on the MikeWagnerShow.com, HamiltonRadio.net, and Diamonds FM. Don't forget to support our program with a generous donation at the MikeWagnerShow.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>